Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian. Our guest today is David Hubert. David Hubert's writing has won the CBC Short Story Prize, the Walrus Poetry Prize, and was a finalist for the 2020 Journey Prize. David's fiction debut, The Peninsula Sinking, won a Dartmouth Book Award, was shortlisted for the Alistair MacLeod Short Fiction Prize, and was runner-up for the Danuta Gled Library Award. David's work has been published in magazines such as The Walrus, Maisonneuve, En Route, and Canadian Notes and Queries, which is published here in Windsor, and anthologized in Best Canadian Stories and The Journey Prize Stories. His second collection, Chemical Valley, is largely set in Sarnia and deals with the ecological legacy of the oil and gas industry, which seems to seep into every aspect of the characters' lives. Also published by Biblioasis here in Windsor, Chemical Valley has been recently been nominated for two Atlantic Book Awards. He joins us from Atlantic Canada. Welcome, David. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Well, on your you of New Brunswick page, you refer to yourself as a dirty nature writer. What does that phrase mean to you? And how does it impact your approach to writing fiction? Uh, yes, I, I do uh, call myself a dirty nature writer. It, uh, I can promise you it has nothing to do with uh, erotic fiction. Um, it is a form of nature writing that sort of wants to complicate um, the traditional, more pristine view of nature. So the dichotomy is like inside, outside, uh, city versus country that we carry around with us and that are actually deeply ideologically conditioned. Um, traditional nature writing, you know, wants us to go out for a walk in the forest, explore the trees, um, what Wordsworth, you know, called the cathedral of the wilderness. And um, that can be problematic for many reasons. One of them is we don't realize that our cities and our everyday lives are part of the natural world. And so it creates a sort of alienation. Um, Dirty Nature wants to confront all the complicated mixtures between our everyday, you know, mostly often urban lives and the non-human life that sustains um, that existence. And I try to be, you know, so, and this is not just depressing. um, It's just a sort of open and honest look at our own way of life. And I try to be, you know, funny with Dirty Nature writing. I try to look at the weird elements. There's some very strange elements um, about the way we coexist with the natural world. For example, like um, there's this plane full of stallions that flies around. Um, I was interested in this in my first book (laughs) and it's, uh, it's a stallion sex plane right so it flies around it's about it's a horse breeding these are like top stallions um for racehorses so this is the kind of like weird environmental thing we're doing these days and just the kind of thing that fascinates me um and oil obviously oil is a dirty grimy substance which is composed of sort of prehistoric natural life and so as a metaphor for me it's sort of a perfect metaphor for dirty nature writing not just insofar as you know, not just insofar as it contributes to climate crisis, et cetera, et cetera, um, not just in terms of moralization and indictment, but also just the fascination of the substance itself. You did start to touch on this a little bit in your previous answer, but um, you said that you became aware of the chemical valley around Sarnia when you studied at the University of Western Ontario in London. Um, what made that situation stand out from other ecological challenges that we face and draw you to writing about it? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, when I was at Western, I I was very interested. In, I became very interested in Sarnia when I sort of learned about it. At first, I didn't really know it was there. Um, then I uh, I learned in, in one of my first PhD courses about a nearby place, Petrolia, small town Petrolia, and the sort of history of oil there, which also plays into... Um, 
you know, that history, that fascinating history of the 19th century oil boom in Lambton County is also very much at the heart of this book, Chemical Valley, as well. Um, and yeah, I visited Petrolia a couple of times. I visited the Oil Museum of Canada, which is really awesome and I recommend. And uh, I knew I came to know some people from Petrolia and some people from the area and all around. Um, some people I played hockey with, actually. And um, but yeah, when I went to Sarnia, I was very struck by the idea that 62 petrochemical refineries could exist on both sides of the river, that, um, you know, this sort of spectacle of industrial capitalism could exist there. And for us in London, you know, this was sort of the, the dragon's lair around the corner, right? It's just, it's this invisible absence that sort of oil always wants to be. And yet also at the same time, I mentioned, you know, I visited Sarnia a few times. I had dear friends who live in Sarnia. I also was very cognizant that like, you know, this is what sustains people's everyday lives. And that this is also at the same time, a beautiful place to live, a, pe a place where people live rich, fulfilling lives. And in that way, it sort of became a parable for our times, right? Where it doesn't really matter where you live. I'm currently in Chibukta, Halifax, and you know, there's a refinery around the corner from here as well, right? Like it's all, it's often conveniently hidden. It's often um, not close to the wealthier neighborhoods, but there's always sort of this trace of, of pollution and toxicity really not too far away from us, right? So I became interested in that as a sort of archetypal example of our time. Wow, yeah, and Chemical Valley in the title story, the main character deals with a work life based in Sarnia Petrolia that seems almost futuristically surreal. And at home, his wife is extremely ill and there's something unbelievable going on in the basement. It's really horrible. Is there something about our current environment or way of life that blurs the line between reality and hallucination for you, for your writing? Thank you. That's also a lovely and perceptive question. I um, I do, yeah, I, I, I don't know <laughs> is the short answer. For me, there is. For, for me, the way I look at my world, there this, this line, there is no hard and fast, and particularly the way I write my fiction, there is no hard and fast line between reality and pressures that are put on reality. For me, that's just sort of how we experience, I try to articulate my fiction to sort of how we experience the world, right? Think, for example, of panic, right? So if I'm trying to articulate panic in fiction, when you're experiencing panic, the reality, right? The idea of objective reality, the idea that the world is stable, neutral, just a place that we walk through, that sort of falls through the cracks, right? When we experience panic, everything sort of gets amplified, everything gets distorted, everything, your heart starts racing, you know, the colors change, you're seeing weird lights. And so, you know, for me, that's sort of what I'm trying to capture often in my fiction, as I approach sort of cathartic and climactic moments. At the same time, I'm also, so I don't know how much of this has to do with environmental history. Um, It'd be interesting to look a little farther back. You know, I, I obviously think of Moby Dick, which is one of my sort of go-to primal fiction teachers. And, you know, in that, I'm not so sure reality is really cut and dry in, in that book either. In fact, I would say it's not really. Um, so I think pushing the boundary of realism is something fiction's always done and always done well. Um, at the same time, like, you know, when I grew up in the 19, I was born in 1985. So when I grew up in uh, late eighties, early nineties, my superheroes were mutants, right? The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? I grew up in the fallout of Chernobyl. That's where my imagination was formed, right? That was a deeply, even Superman, you look at Superman, right? Superman's a mutant as well, uh, radioactive, right? So uh, all of this is very, it's a complicated tapestry in which we live. Um, I think, but for me, my imaginative world was always formed profoundly and not necessarily even in a bad way. This could be in an empowering way by, you know, mutation, toxicity, and environmental disaster. Yeah. Um, in another topic that you looked at a couple of times in this collection, um, in Cruelty, Deepa is a new mother. She's obsessing about a mice infestation and how the least cruel way is to kill the mice. And she eventually succumbs to both being cruel to the mice and her husband. There's a hockey player and a reluctant enforcer who winds up at the end of a story losing it and being another player very badly. Um, People have always had that capacity to be cruel, but how does our life today perhaps impact that? What is it that you're, you're looking at in those situations? 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. I'm, you know, cruelty, violence, um, these are certainly something I'm trying to explore in the in the collection as well, and just sort of um, the limits of of human connection is something that I'm interested in throughout the collection. And I think environmental pressures, but also socio socioeconomic pressures, put a lot of sort of strain on that. And also um, health pressures. You know, there's disease comes up in a couple of these stories. So, you know, I want to look at. I want to test my characters. I want to look at how my characters respond to deep-seated pressures. I want to feel with and alongside my characters in profound moments, deep moments, sometimes unsettling moments, sometimes hard moments. You know, that's when we are tested. And for me, that's just what fiction, what fiction does at its best, and and what I was interested in doing. So. Um, yeah, testing these characters, seeing how they respond. Um, Deepa, <laughs> I'm glad you brought up that example because that was a very sort of perhaps might not seem to be totally autobiographical to me, but we did in my family have a mouse infestation when I had a little baby. And uh, both of us became very, very fascinated by the mice because symbolically they represent, all you know, many, It's it's very interesting how urgently you want to keep them out of your house and how urgently you know you don't want your baby to crawl around and eat mouse poo um and how sort of so that's a different sort of a different version of toxicity as well and a very sort of visceral version of toxicity and yeah in that story i think it's about motherhood it's about what we will do in order to protect our children it's about yeah we you know how our morality can be put to the test when it comes to uh, a small very successful toxic invaders. Mice are also interesting because they succeed alongside the human species, right? They depend on us. They thrive in human cultures, right? So it becomes very fascinating, paradoxical in many ways and, and, and re can reveal the worst in us, I guess. In addition to working people, you also have stories about teenagers and then trying to navigate the world as we all are. I don't want to date myself, but I was at Western when you were around the time you were born. So you have a different perspective on this. And, you know, some of these teenagers are having adult relationships with adults. And why do you think it's different for young people about navigating the world now? And what special challenges do they face? What brought you to care about the teenagers that you wanted to write about? Yeah, well, I think many things. Um, the teenage experience is just such a volatile moment in life. And we experience things so profoundly when we're teenagers. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons that's always drawn. You know, it was an important place for me in my memory, uh, an important phase to sort of think through. In those stories, um, I'm also writing about uh, like teenage climate activists who I was sort of very inspired by around the time, right? And, or sort of, you know, would be teenage climate activists. People are certainly looking towards that movement to try to find something, uh, something that might guide them, some sort of guidance there. And yeah, my wife is also a high school teacher. So she spends a lot of time thinking about teenagers, thinking about what they're going through. And so, and I, and I was trying to emphasize as well uh, with my two little, empathize as well with my two little girls and thinking about what they're gonna be going through in the not too distant future. And so there are many things are sort of going on in, in my attempt to sort of grapple with uh, the teenage experience. I do think, like I said, teenagers experience the world particularly profoundly. And so in a way that's sort of excellent material <laughs> for fiction because uh, fiction is just a space to explore the amplification of feeling and to try to connect with readers at the level of feeling. And I don't know if the teenage uh, experience is sort of more dangerous now than it used to be or um, more sort of vulnerable. Uh, certainly the teenagers that I depict have nefarious adult relationships in their lives. And I think maybe those are just more open now or more exposed perhaps than they used to be. But I think um, we all have adults manipulating us when we're teenagers in various ways, in various, you know, more and less positive ways. Um, we manipulate each other as human beings. 
that's one of the things I'm I'm interested in. Whenever someone says, you know, you manip you're manipulating me, I'm sort of thinking, well, yeah, we're we're all manipulating each other all the time. And that's one of the things I tell my students actually is about how every character is always motivated and you need to look hard at those motivations. So yeah, there's there's an adult that manipulates a teenager and and in, in one of these stories, and I think uh, the morality of the story is pretty clear about who's in the right and who's in the wrong there. But there's also some some subtleties around the negotiation and, and uh, you know, when is it okay to have a relationship? When is it okay to tell your father, not tell your father, um, to call your teacher by their first name, right? Uh, so, I mean, try, I'm trying to explore the subtleties, I guess, beyond the obviousness of, of the right and wrong morality that, that is pretty clear in, in that story. So maybe one of the major differences is openness and that's not all bad, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Teenagers are so exposed and they're so, they identify so strongly, for example, with the music that they like. Right. And they'll like just one, you know, my Natasha, my, my wife, her, her students, they'll just like one type of music and one musician and they'll just be totally obsessed and they'll so deeply profoundly identify with that one musician. And it, it's such an interesting time of life in that way, in terms of self-definition, I guess as well. We're working so hard at that age to self-define. It's fascinating. The book is divided into two sections. The first section being named after the title story, Chemical Valley, and then the second after Dream Haven. Now that story is about an IVF patient who is injected with the sperm of an unscrupulous doctor. So in your view, how do those two sections relate to one another? How do they work together or maybe play off one another? Yes. So the second uh, half of the book, Dream Haven, is um, more thematically related uh, than, than, than the first half. The first half is much more drenched, much more obviously drenched in oil and sort of the characters interconnect and it's, you know, it almost works um, like a linked short story collection. There's, there's more linkages, characters interact with each other, et cetera. And it's all very deeply mired in petroleum. The second section moves away from Sarnia, sort of moves around different towns in Southwestern Ontario. And one of the stories is set in Chicago as well. And, um, it's more thematically linked, as I said, but but the theme is chemicals, right? Um, every story, if you look into them, has certain chemical uh, behaviors and certain strange chemical behaviors. For example, someone is uh, uh, a dentist accidentally injects somebody with Clorox, right? And um, just sort of we see the fallout of that as as they. Uh, as the dentist loses their job and becomes a doomsday prepper. And um, so chemicals, I think, is the main thing that brings together this second story. So sort of looking more opaquely at the way that um, the petrochemical industry and also the chemical industry affects things like healthcare. So what it means to be like, so that IVF patient, as you mean, as you mentioned, um, in the story Dream Haven, calls to mind what it just some of the nuances and and difficulties and possibilities around what happens when we when we live in a world where something like IVF is possible right some of the new ethical conundrums that emerge in that situation and uh, as you know you'll likely know there was uh, quite this was based on a real case that happened in Canada um, not too long ago as well right so thematic yes the second half I would say is 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 thematically Mm -hmm. Yeah, your prose has certainly got that sort of ripped from the headlines kind of aspect of the subject matter. And you also write poetry and you've, congratulations, you've won the Walrus Poetry Award. Can you tell me about your approach to that kind of different way of sharing language? Is it similar? Is it different than your fiction work? Do you do, do them at the same time or, or do you have to focus on one and the other? Um, yeah, lately I definitely have been concentrating more on writing fiction. Um, but I think the poet is very much at work in me all the time. The poet and the fiction writer are the same person to a, a very real degree. Um, I sort of started with writing poetry, and that's where I learned the you know principles around the economy of language and the use of metaphor that are really, really central to my fiction writing. Um, so, yeah, and I also think there's sort of a, a powerful connection between the short story as a genre and the poem um, in that both can work on images, right? So you'll notice a lot 
lot of images in my stories if you read them. Uh, my stories work through metaphor and they, they build momentum through paradoxes actually, so through the juxtaposition of images and also through, um, yeah, images that might not seem obviously to connect with anything that's happening in the plot, but which are, are, are suggestive images. So a short story can work sort of like uh, a chord, right, in music, the way different notes can come together to create a harmonic whole. Right, and I think a poem can do that as well, and uh, and that's what I love about the the relationship between a short story and a poem. And it's not necessarily, you know, there's people that uh, compare. There's a tendency because they're both fiction to compare uh, the short story with the novel, but I think actually there might be more in common at times. Uh, the sh the short story might almost be more like a narrative poem than it is like a, a condensed novel, right? That is a very interesting perspective. So so what are you working on now? What is it that you're writing? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, I can tell you that I'm writing a novel. Uh, it's continuing to explore many of the things that um, are explored in sort of the first half of Chemical Valley. So it's definitely uh, highly concerned with oil and with the uh, uh, southwestern Ontario region. And um, yeah, so I can't say too much more than that because um, you never know how it'll end up shaping up. But uh, it's it's exciting and, and enjoyable for me right now. Well, interesting because we just mentioned the, the difference between a short story and a, a novel. What are, what are you finding different about writing it? I'm finding there's a whole lot of new challenges and um, yeah, just trying to make sure there's enough scope and enough breadth. And I'm reading a lot about novel writing and some of that is more helpful than <laughs> other parts. And um, I'm trying just to, I'm trying to write it as intuitively as possible, but um, yeah, there are, I'm continuing to write very much as, as, as I've always written, which is, you know, it's a, it's an image heavy novel and it's, it's very interested in, in oil and it's trying to bounce some of those images off each other. But my stories, uh, as you might have also intuit or sensed when reading them, uh, they often build to a very, I try to build to a lyrical crescendo in all of my stories, right? I try to really get momentum towards the end. So it's an interesting challenge to try to sort of migrate some of that momentum into the level of smaller sections um, and to sort of keep it and hold on to it in that way um, rather than being like, okay, I'm like close to the end of the story. Here's where like I can start to really sort of motor. Um, so it's an interesting, it's a little bit of an interesting challenge uh, for me in that way. Well, look forward to um talking to you when that comes out. Do you find that your modus operandi is changing? Or do you have like big um, sheets of, of outlines on the wall or spreadsheets or anything like that? Is that different from short story writing or are you just, just working with your images as beautifully as you have done? <laughs> I tried uh, planning <laughs> and uh, I, I don't recommend it for everyone. I don't, I don't, yeah, I think for me, uh, over planning a project really takes the joy out of it for me. And I sort of need to find it as I go. So I'm very much fumbling my way through. I, I fumble my, how I work with my short story and how I work, how I'm working on the novel are quite similar in that I'm fumbling my way through and then I revise and revising for me is really where the joy is. Um, when I revise, I sort of feel like a composer moving around parts and um, I get to hear the music of my piece. And um, that for me is, is the reward. And, and I also have to do the intellectual work of trying to figure out what I'm telling my reader and what I'm setting up and how I can resolve that. And, um, but a lot of that happens intuitively and at the subconscious level. Um, yeah, so, and it all happens falls onto the page through editing eventually. Good luck with that. We'd love to hear you read from your work. Would you like to share some of your work for us? Yes, I've said so much about it. I think, um, yeah, I would love to. Okay, so I'm gonna read a little bit from uh, the story we've talked about. It's it's the title story of the book. It's called Chemical Valley. And um, the, the narrator, first person narration. The narrator is uh, named Jer, and he is a uh, petrochemical operator. And he lives at home with, uh, with his wife, Eileen, who's, who's not unwell. And um, I think that's about all you need to know. 
as I mentioned as well, this, the story works through parataxis, so through pairing of images, unlikely images off each other. So I'm going to give you a bit of a sample of that um, at the end as well. I'm telling Eileen how I want to be buried, namely inside a tree. We're sitting in bed eating Thai from the mall and listening to the 6 p.m. construction outside our window. The city tearing up the whole street along with tree roots and a rusted tangle of lead pipes. And I'm telling Eileen, it's called a biodegradable burial pod. Mouthful of cashew curry, and I'm saying, what they do is put your remains in this egg looking thing, like the xenomorph's cocoon from Alien Resurrection. But it's made of biodegradable plastic. I'm telling Eileen it's called Capsula Mundi, and what they do is hitch the remains to a semi-mature tree and plant the whole package, stuff you down in fetal position, and let you gradually decay until you become nitrogen, seep into soil. Picking a bamboo shoot from her molars, Eileen says, since when are you into trees? She says it's smug says it like Miss University Sciences and nobody else is allowed to like trees. I don't tell her how we're all compost. And yes, I read that on a Facebook link. I also did not tell her about the article's tagline, your carbon footprint doesn't end in the grave. Reaching for the pad thai, I tell her about the balance, how it's only natural, how the human body's rich in nitrogen, how when you use a coffin, there's a lot of waste because the body just rots on its own when it could be giving nutrients to the system, not to mention all the metals and treated wood in coffins. I tell her how the idea is to phase out traditional graveyards entirely, replace them with grave forests. Hmm, Eileen says, gazing out the window, the sky a caramelized rose. Is this a guilt thing? from working at the plants? I tell her no, maybe, I don't know. An excavator hisses its load into the earth. In 1971, the Trudeau government issued a $10 bill picturing Sarnia's new refinery metropolis as a pay-in to Canadian progress. Inked in regal purple, the buildings rise up space-aged and triumphant a Jetson's wet dream. Towers jab through the sky and cloud-like drums pepper the ground, a suspended rail line curling through the scene. Smokestacks and ladders and tanks and tubs, glimmering steel and perfect concrete, a shimmering fairy city and the strange thing is that what you don't see is oil, what you never see is oil. The other strange thing is that this is how Sarnia used to be seen. That not so long ago, the plants were shiny and dazzling, and now they're rusty with paint peeling off the drums and poor maintenance schedules and regular leaks and weeds all over stitching concrete seams. Thanks, I think I'll leave it there. David Hubert, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for being here and for your wonderful questions. Yeah, it was a pleasure to chat. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.